good afternoon everybody and happy independence day my name is rajni rai and i'm going to start today nanotechnology in this session i'll cover all the important questions which is being asked for nanotechnology there are only two sets we have short answer questions and long answer question in short answer question we have only two topics and rest all are for long answer questions so just let us start with the nanotechnology before we get into it we must have a little or basic idea about what is a nanomaterial or what is the word nano is as you can on see on the screen i have nano is nothing but it is equals to 10 to power minus 9 meter any substance whose dimension is within this range that is 10 to power minus 9 meters is called as nano material if you talk about the nano scale the nano scale is between 1 to it is between 1 to it is between 1 to 100 nanometers the meaning of this scale is anything whose any one dimension is within the range of 1 to 100 nanometer all those substances are called as nano materials now for example suppose i have a substance or a material whose only one dimension is within the nano scale range that is between 1 to 100 nanometers then that materials are basically in form of layers or in form of thin films or they are also in the form of surface coating second suppose if any materials two dimensions are within the nano scale range then they are basically in form of nano wires or nano tubes for example fullerenes fullerenes is nothing but allotropes of carbon which are nothing but graphene sheet the first fullerenes was buckminster fullerenes c60 this was the first carbon nano tube which was being discovered in 1985 so you can see that it is just 36 years old back when they have actually discovered about the beauty of nano materials the third one is if any materials whose all the three dimensions are within the nano scale so they are basically precipitates or colloidal particles now to make you understand this little clearly let us say i have any object and we know that it has three dimensions x y and z now what i'm talking here is suppose if any materials any one dimension is within the nano scale range then they all are called as nano materials similarly if there are two dimensions which are within the nano scale then also it is called as nano material and they will be in form of wires or tube suppose i have all the three dimension within the nano scale then they are basically precipitates or colloidal particle so what we have just discussed is what is the meaning of nano material or what is a nano material is now to give you a brief or little idea i have drawn here one diagram where we you can see that if i talk about the bacteria bacteria is not in the nano scale the size of the bacteria is 1 micrometer so the bacteria doesn't counts under the nano scale but if you see here virus a virus or atoms they are within the scale of 1 to 100 nanometer so i'm trying to give you an idea that how small a nano material can be with the help of example of virus or molecules or atoms now the question is i'll give you one more example i've taken example of gold material now basically if you see the gold it will be yellow in color it is uh, glittery and uh, if uh, if you keep it on if it, it absorbs the heat energy properly so basically it is a good conductor of heat and electricity these are some basic property of the gold but the same gold if i study at the nano scale level we have seen that 
the color of gold is no more yellow but it is in brown or orange or maybe lastly in the red color means as i reduce the nano scale level it will be in brown color then orange color or maybe finally it will become red in color not only this much apart from it it is showing very high conductivity comparative to what it shows at the normal scale next it also reflects the ir rays so here the same gold material which was showing different properties at normal scale is showing different property at nano scale the question is how what is the main reason what are the factor which makes the nano particle of gold that special than that of the normal scale than that of the normal scale now there are two important factors first is quantum confinement and the second one is surface to volume ratio so there are two important factor which makes a normal material different from a na nano material the first one is quantum confinement and the second one is surface to volume ratio now here these two factors are also for short answer question in short answer question they will ask you define quantum confinement or they'll ask you define the surface to volume ratio or sometimes they will ask you uh, give the uh, main what is the main reason that a nano material show different property then there you have to mention both these two things you have to mention quantum confinement as well as you have to mention the surface to volume ratio so one by one i'll explain you what is the definition of quantum confinement and surface to volume ratio now coming to quantum confinement first of all let us just understand the meaning of confinement word the meaning of confinement word is putting somebody behind the bars means putting a person or prisoner behind the bar so when a prisoner is behind the bars his motion is being restricted within the four walls right so the basic english meaning of confinement is to putting somebody within a restricted area now here i am using another term that is quantum confinement so basically what i'm going to do here is i am going to restrict the motion of particle i'm going to confine the motion of the particle which level at quantum level now to understand it let us take example of particle in one dimensional box now we have all studied about it the particle is one dimensional box the height of the wall is infinite now imagine that part and listen to my instruction and imagine again now i am reducing the height of the wall which was infinite i'm kept on reducing i'm reducing i'm making it so small that say at the order of some de broglie wavelength basically the de broglie wavelength it will have few tens of nanometer the dimension will be that small so i have reduced the dimension of the wall so small that it reach to the nano scale level now the particle which is present inside here i cannot have any particle but obviously electron the electron which is present in that particular box now will show different properties it will show high energy now you can see here the same thing, thing is being mentioned here that when the electron is being confined in a box whose dimension is of few tens of the nanometer the energy of in electron has been increased its energy is being in increased why it is being increased because it is being restricted or confined to a very small area now if you want to further understand this i can give you one more example just imagine that uh, i have a classroom in which we have nearly say uh, 20 students and i'm having a heater inside it so when we are heating when i'm we have put on the heater the room will start getting heated up but everybody is not feeling the same kind of warmth 
Now just imagine that I am decreasing the size of the classroom in such a way that only one student can sit there and heater is the same capacity. Now you can understand that the student, the one student who is sitting will feel more energy or more heat, right? So basically what I did, I have reduced the size of the class and when I did that, the energy through the heat energy has been increased in the classroom. Now similar way it is. So here the quantum confinement is nothing but when we restrict the motion of particle within the quantum level, within the walls of the quantum dimension or in short nothing but the nanoscale level then the properties of the material will be different. Pro the material will show different property. It is not only its uh, uh, electrical property, but it shows different optical properties, electrical, chemical, as well as magnetic properties. So overall, it will affect the property of the material. Now moving to the next factor, this question will be for one marks. If they ask you state quantum confinement, the next one is surface to volume ratio. On the screen, you can see I have drawn three cubes, right? And let us say that and this is the biggest one, this is the second one, and this is the smallest one. Let us say the dimension of length of this cube is say one centimeter. And let us say this is the length is say two centimeters. Now what basically I am going to do here is, I am going to find out surface area, then I will find out volume and then I will take the ratio. Now what is the surface area? Surface area of a cube is nothing but 6 into L square. And what is here my dimension of the cube is? Say 2 centimeters. So 6 into 2 square which is nothing but 6 into 4 and this is 24. Now the second part is I need to find out its volume. Now volume of the cube is A or L cube. It is L cube and here dimension is 2 cube. So obviously it is 8. Clear? Now what we have to do here again, I have to take the ratio of these two. So I am going to divide these two factors, surface area to volume ratio. Now 24 by 8 will give me 6, sorry, 3. will give me 3, right? Now same thing let us do with the small cube. Now I know this surface area is equals to 6 into L square. So I have 6 into here the length is 1 centimeter. So that is 1. It is equals to 6. And next is the volume. So volume of the cube is L cube. And here in this case it is 1. Now take the ratio of them. 6 by 1 is equals to 6 centimeters. Now if you see here, surface to volume ratio of a bigger cube is 3 and surface to volume ratio of the smaller cube is actually 6, which is more. So here, surface to volume ratio for the smaller cube is more, whereas for the bigger cube, it is small. So this is the second important factor which will make nanomaterial different from the normal material. Moving to the next slide. The next one is fabrication of nanomaterial. Fabrication of nanomaterial, it is a long answer question and any, any fabrication can be asked. It's a random choice you have to prepare all the fabrication because randomly anything can come and it is for 5 marks. Fabrication of nanotechnology are broadly classified in two types. The first one is bottom up technique and second one is top down technique. Now we have to concentrate on what we speak. 
whatever word I use, you have to concentrate on that. If you concentrate on that, it becomes easy and logical for you to remember what is the procedure. For example, just now I told top down, top down. Now here I will have a bulk material, a huge or large material. I'll make it down. I'll make it small. So I have a bulk material which is a top material, then I am converting into smaller material, means I am putting it down. So in top-down technique, we will take bulk materials, huge and large materials, we will convert them in form of powder and from the powder we will make nano materials. Whereas in bottom-up, here again you look, out, look, uh, look at the words, Bottom up. Now bottom means I will have precursors or small atoms or molecules because bottom down. So I have small atoms or molecules will form clusters and from the cluster I am going to make the nanomaterial. So from the bottom I am going to make it up. Now I will again just refresh it. There are two kinds of fabrication possible. First is top down and second is bottom up. In top down fabrication, we will have bulk material, we will convert them in powder and then from there I will make my desired nanomaterial. Whereas in bottom up technique, we will have small atoms or molecules, we form clusters, from the clusters I will form the nanomaterial. Both bottom up and top down techniques there are three, three different types in it and all the types are equally important. Now you can see here, I have bottom up technique in that we have sol gel process, second precipitation process and third is combustion method. Whereas for top down procedure, we have ball miling method, physical vapor deposition in short PVD method. Third is chemical vapor deposition which is nothing but in short CVD technique. Now all the six things which you see on the screen right now are equally important and they are very simple. You have to just remember their name, remember the name, I will give you the logic and then you can easily produce it into the papers. Now you have to remember the words under bottom up sol gel method, second precipitation method, third combustion method. I am stressing on the words which you should keep in your head. Top down procedure, ball miling, physical vapor deposition, third chemical vapor deposition. One by one, we will discuss all these methods along with their advantages and disadvantages. Starting with bottom up technique, the first one is sol gel. Now there is a big picture on the screen you can see. This is the diagram for sol gel process. Now everything you need not to mug it up, you understand the diagram. From the diagram, we can develop the logic and then we can keep it into the sentence form. Before we enter into it, there are few things which you must know. For example, what is the meaning of sol? Similarly, what is the meaning of gel? Then what do you mean by precursor? And what is the meaning of calcination? So I will give you the idea about that first and then we will go in flow. First of all, come to the sol word. If any colloidal particles are suspended in liquid phase, it will give rise to sol. It is like suppose I have some colloidal particle and I am dissolving into say in water or in any liquid phase. So whatever the mixture you get will be called as sol. Next, gel. Gel is 
when a colloidal particle is suspended in solid or semi solid state for example you all are having jams at home or you might have eaten jelly jellies in uh, when you you must be a kid you might be having jellies as a toffees and all uh, if you press it will be like a rubber kind if it can be it will get pressed it will be like a rubber kind means like a gel material so there the gel which you see or the jellies which you see they are not in liquid phase they are not even completely solid they are in between like semi solid so any colloidal particle when it is suspended into solid or semi solid form then we call it as gel now coming to the word precursor now precursor these are nothing but some chemical compound in which we will add some more chemical and a new product will be formed anything any chemical compound in which you add some reactants and then you get a new product out of it will be called as precursor now in my case precursor is always a material of whom you want to make the nano material so whichever materials nano particle you want to produce that will be taken as precursor coming to the next word calcination now calcination is nothing but heating up of any substance or material in absence of air or oxygen so when you heat something any material in absence of air or oxygen then we call it as calcination process so i hope the meaning of sol gel precursor and calcination is clear to you now i'll just show you what is on this screen and then we will go into the flow now here i have taken precursor precursor is nothing but the material whose nano material you want to make so this is your precursor you are dissolving it into the water and you are making a solution which is called as salt then from salt it is dehydrated undergone polycondensation and you got a gel from the gel again you are having some procedures through which you are getting different kinds of nano material so now just let me start with this part first of all the material whose nano particle you want to make we will take it as a precursor in my case i am taking metal oxide i am taking any metal alkoxide and i am mixing it with the water when we mix the metal oxide in water we'll get a stable solution this stable solution is called as sol so here i have taken metal alkoxide mixed with the water made a homogeneous solution that stable solution which we got is called as sol once you get the stable solution sol under polycondensation process or in short under dehydration reaction means i'm trying to evaporate all the excess fluid or liquid present inside the sol and i am reaching to what which state i am reaching to the gel stage so how we are getting gel here whatever sol material you are having let it undergo polycondensation or dehydration due to which all the excess water molecules will be removed and finally a semi solid material which is called as gel is being obtained so here uh as the color is not visible let me just again write it here i'm using here metal alkoxide i have taken precursor of metal alkoxide i dissolved it into the water when we dissolved into the water a stable solution is being formed and which is called as sol sol basically it is a stable solution this stable solution will undergo dehydration or polycondensation means i am removing removing the excess water from the material and we are reaching to the stage of gel now the gel which i have received it is basically having metal hydroxide and metal chain 
or it may also have some alcohol chain inside it. That gel, now if it undergoes rapid drying, means I have a gel and I am heating under extreme condition. Let us say up to 800 degrees Celsius, I have heated it rapidly. Under very extreme conditions, I am heating it up. Then it will give, give us aerogel, which is nothing but a nano material. So, gel, when it undergoes heating process or drying process rapidly, let us say up to 800 to 900 degrees Celsius, it is giving my new nano material, which is called as aerogel. Now, let us say the same gel, if it is allowed to undergo drying procedure under normal situation and circumstances, means I am giving time to the gel to get all the extra molecule to get evaporated normally, not uh, up to 800 degrees Celsius, let us say up to say uh, 100 to 200 degrees Celsius, then it will give rise to a new material which is called as zero gel. Here aerogel and zero gel both are nano material. Once we reach to the zero gel, from here this material will again further getting heated up and I am further drying it but this time in the absence of the oxygen or air. That is nothing but I am allowing the zero gel to undergo calcination. And after that, what I get is the dense ceramic material. Now here, dense ceramic material is nothing but it's like a paste, the toothpaste which you use every day. What is the consistency of that? In the paste form, it will be. So dense ceramic material which you see here is nothing but the paste kind of nano material. Now coming back to the sol. If sol undergo spinning and dipping. Now here I have taken the sol and I am spinning it and dipping it. Now in order to understand this I have a very good example. You all have uh, might have eaten uh, laddu, bundi ka laddu. You take what how they cook is they take a big stainer onto which they will add a paste. And when they pour the paste onto it, one person will keep dipping it and one person will be keep spinning it. So at the down in the vessel where oil is there, you will see the small balls are formed, mostly uniform shaped, right? So here exactly we are going to do the same thing. I am having sol which is already in the liquid phase. I am dipping it and I am spinning it, dipping it and spinning it. And when I am doing so, a layer, a thin layer of nano material is formed. That thin layer will undergo calcination and finally I will have my nano material in form of film coating, means a thin layer kind of a coating. If the same sol undergo dehydration, it will form clusters. Here what you see, they are nothing but clusters. Now I allowed the sol to undergo dehydration, so they will form like cluster. Uh, in order to understand this thing, let us say you have some uh, sticky and jelly material and you are, uh, uh, suppose with your finger trip, if you try to play with it, it will small, 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 small particles, sticky particles will be formed. It's like a cluster. Cluster means like a group, a small group of molecules or atoms are formed. So, it will be in the same form and that is what is called as cluster. So sol, when it undergo dehydration, it will form clusters. From the clusters, again, the, it will undergo calcination process and finally you will get the nano material in form of powder. Because my precursor was a metal alkoxide, obviously the nano material which I am getting here will be in oxide form. Here also you have seen the gel is nothing but metal hydroxide and metal or some alcohol chain. So here whatever nano material you are getting, you will get in form of alkoxide or oxide. Now about the sol gel process, whatever I have spoke so far is written in the next slide. 
Now, from this diagram itself, there are three things very clear. First one is, you have to make sol, then you have to make gel. From sol and gel, further you can get different types of nanomaterial. The beauty of this process is that you are getting nanomaterial in three different states. Like you are getting in form of dense ceramic, you are getting in form of powder, as well as you are getting in form of thin film or thin coatings. Now, whatever I have told you so far, it is written in point form, in point manner it is written here. Uh, you need not to mug it up, you have to just remember this diagram and go in the flow. There are some basic definition, for example, uh, what is the meaning of sol, gel, calcination, dehydration, polycondensation. These things you must know exactly. You cannot alter with the definition part. Definition must be read and produced on the papers exactly. We cannot change that. So those things you prepare properly. Definition must be in a proper sentence. Later you can make your own sentence by seeing the diagram itself. And if you are not comfortable, I will advise you always prepare the bookish language because that is the standard language. In do and die situation, you can use your own language, but I suggest you always follow the bookish language because that is the standard language. That will impress the examiner if they read the sentence, two, three sentences, they will understand that you know the topic. Now, the procedure part is again what I have explained is written here. Now, going to the advantages of this process. Now, the very first advantage is it is producing a high quality nanomaterial of mono sized. Here the nanomaterial which is being produced, it is of nano or uh, mono sized. Mono means having same sized obviously because it is having mono sized, the quality is high or good. The second one is it is easy to manufacture you can easily make it. It was not difficult. You did not have any complex separators there or complex machinery or some complex technique. It was simple. It is of low cost because whatever you need is under your budget. Uh, anybody can do it. It is not very expensive. Like it is not like a diamond or tungsten or some expensive material. It is all available, easily available materials you have. Next, it is easy to maintain. The maintenance part means once we uh, perform the experiment and when we see the result and after that when we have to maintain the apparatus, it is easy to maintain. The next thing is which I have already uh, told you that we are getting nanomaterial in three states. I am getting in dense, I am getting in form of thin sheet, I am getting in powder form as well as I am getting in the form of ceramics. So when we have nanomaterial in three different states, types, it becomes easy for me to have a wide application of it. With the same sol gel process, if I want my application needs ceramic kind of nanomaterial, I can make it. If my application needs say thin sheet of the nanomaterial, I can get that. I can just make sure that I should not go to the gel to sol itself. I should stop. I should stop back to the sol process and from there I can get powder, powder form or maybe the thin form thin film form. If I want in ceramic, then I should not go for, uh, I should not go for this procedure. I should go from salt to gel and from gel through calcination and get the dense material. Now disadvantage. Yes, obviously there are two important disadvantages. First is controlling the growth of the particles are very difficult. Means once you started the reaction, the reaction will take place. You have no control onto it. It's, it's not like that you can increase or decrease the speed or you can stop it or you can pause it. There is no such facility when you are doing with sol gel process. Second is difficult to control agglomeration. Now here agglomeration means what? For example, I was making the nanomaterial. My requirement is, uh, let us say, uh, my requirement for 1 gram or 2 grams. That was my requirement. But once you start the process, I have taken 1 gram and 2 gram of nanomaterial, after that I do not need it. But the process will continue and you have to collect, you have, uh, there will be accumulation of nanomaterial. Though you need only 1 gram or 2 gram, 
but how much ever the reaction has to take place and how much of it has to be produced, it will be produced and it is a random process. I cannot give a guarantee that will, you will get exactly 1 gram or you will get exactly 1 kg. We cannot give that guarantee. So, to be safe side, we will always use the content and ingredient in such a way that it should give little more than what we expect. So, there is a collection of extra sample. So, that is nothing but we cannot, it is difficult for me to control the agglomeration of the nanomaterials. Now, coming to the next one is application. Now, there are three important application. The first one is zeolite synthesis. Zeolite synthesis is nothing but where you remove the hardness of the water permanently or maybe temporarily from the water. That process is called as zeolite synthesis. So, we use sol gel, through the sol gel we will get the nanomaterial and those nanomaterials are basically made used in the zeolite synthesis process. Apart from that, the ceramic, the ceramic part, the dense ceramic part of the nanomaterial is very useful in reverse osmosis, microfiltration as well as ultrafiltration means they are again going to filter some kind of fluid. It need not to be always water. It can be any fluid. So, this particular process, the reverse osmosis are used basically at water filtration. You will have a big water plant where you filter the water. There we will have candles. Those candles will have a nanode layer, a nanomaterial layer coating will be there. And that can be produced through sol gel process. Now, this microfiltration and ultrafiltration is basically used in big, big industries. Not only for filtration of water, but any fluid which they want to filter from something. Second, the third one is, it is also used in medical field in controlled drug release. Now, uh, there are some patients, they need a specific medicine in a specific amount at a specific time. For example, a patient is suffering from say uh, a small children basically. It is very useful when our small children is there and they are having sugar problem for example. You might have seen that some small children they will have on their arm one needle. One, uh, one sticker kind of thing you will see there. That sticker kind of thing is actually having a needle which will insert into their skin that needle will transmit the drug at a one particular time every day in a particular controlled amount. It will automatically sense and it will release the medicine. So, there we can use the nano material prepared by sol gel process where the drugs can be released in a controlled way at a particular time. For setting the time and all, we have separate mechanism. We will use microcontrollers for that. But for release of the medicine, the micro part of the medicine, we can use the nanomaterial. Now, moving to the next one is the combustion method. It is a very simple method. Just remember the words. You have to just remember the words. Automatically, everything will be clear. What is the meaning of combustion? If anything, any material which catches fire in the presence of oxygen is called as combustion. Here we are going to do the same thing. I am going to prepare the nanomaterial by burning of some substance in the presence of the oxygen. But basically, we will use metal nitrates here. I am using metal nitrates in order to produce the nanomaterial. Means here precursor is nothing but metal nitrate. Now, to understand the combustion, we have two things. First one is oxidizer and second one is fuel. These are the two magic things, that is it. I need to have an oxidizer plus I need to have some kind of fuel. Now, oxidizer is the material which will produce oxygen plus fuel. Fuel is nothing but it will be in form of any, orga any organic fuel, glycerin, urea. These are the example of fuel. So, what we will do is we will take the oxidizer, I will mix it with the fuel and finally, I will get the nano material or nanoparticle. 
Now, for example, I am using here metal nitrates. So, metal nitrate is my oxidizer. I am mixing it with some fuel. Let us say it could be anything. It could be an organic fuel. It could be a gislin. It could be urea. It, any organic fuel, you are, we are mixing them together. Now, what is happening? I will mix them together. That part I have written here. Metal nitrate is mixed with some fuel. After mixing it, we will make a homogeneous mixture. Homogeneous mixture is nothing but I make sure that complete metal nitrate will dissolve uniformly inside my fuel. Once that homogeneous solution is produced, this homogeneous solution must be kept in furnace. I cannot, he, though we have shown here a simple beaker, but it should be kept inside the furnace. So once we keep it inside the furnace, what will happen due to the heat? We will increase the temperature and due to the heat of the temperature, uh, because of the heat which is produced, this homogeneous mixture will undergo evaporation as well as condensation. So basically what we are trying to do here is, I am trying to remove the extra fluid from my system so that a viscous gel-like material can be formed. So that is the reason the homogeneous solution will be kept inside the furnace, will increase the temperature, let it go up to say 300 to say 800 degrees Celsius, not beyond that. So what will happen? Evaporation and condensation will take place and finally a viscous kind of material will be formed. This viscous gel material, once it is reached to that place, is already having an oxidizer, which is metal nitrate. So what will happen? Soon it will catch fire. And within one to two minutes, complete thing will be burnt up and you will get a soft and fluffy foam. This soft and fluffy foam which you see are nothing but the nano material of what? Here in my case it is metal nitrate. So I am getting a nano material of metal nitrate in the form of soft and fluffy foam. Now I can give you a, a, a related example so that you can remember it. Uh, let us say I have a Deepak at home or maybe a candle and you, uh, it's, it's, you lit the deep, Deepak or candle and invert a plate onto it. After some period of time, you will see some black kind of suit will be formed underneath that plate. Right Now you flip it and you take that suit and spread on the skin. You will say uniformly a black spread will be there on your hand. Actually that black spread which you see on the hands, they are nano material of carbon. Same way I have produced here nano material for nitrates. It's a similar procedure. I hope it is clear and it is easy also. So I'll just rewind it once again for combustion process. I need an oxidizer and a fuel. Here in my case, we have taken an example of metal nitrate as an oxidizer and I can take glycerin or urea or any organic fuel as a fuel. We'll mix them together and form a homogeneous mixture of it. That homogeneous mixture will be kept inside the furnace and once we start increasing the temperature, the mixture will start evaporating and undergo condensation and finally I'll get a viscous gel material. That viscous gel material, because it is containing oxidizer, automatically catches fire and burns out within one to two minutes, very fast, very quickly. And finally, what you get in the form of soft and fluffy foam is your nano material. Now, whatever I have told you, it's written in form of steps here. Very simple. Metal nitrate as an oxidizer mixed with, say, organic fuel, say, glycerin. And output is nothing but metal oxide, nanomaterial, nanoparticle of the metal oxide plus some gases. Now the mixture is uniform mixture, mixed solution of the above reactants kept into the furnace. Once it is under the furnace, it will undergo evaporation and condensation and finally a viscous gel material will be formed. That viscous gel material, it will catch fire Within one to two minutes, it will be completely burnt and result will be the nanomaterial of metal oxides. You can see here very easily I have written. 
same procedure within four or five steps we have written. Now, coming to the advantages. First advantage, it is time and energy efficient. It takes place very quickly, what I have mentioned. So, because it's, it takes very less time, it is time efficient. Similarly, the energy means whatever input I am providing, according to that, whatever output I am getting is more. So, it is energy efficient. Next is equipments are very simple. You can see that I need not to have any complex apparatus and all. Very simple equipments are there. I need to have some beakers, I need to have furnace, and I should have material like oxidizer as well as fuel. Now, third is raw material is low in cost. The raw material, raw material here means nothing but metal oxide, glycerin or the organic fuel. They are the raw material, they are the basic material which can form the nanomaterial. So, those are of less cost. So, it is economical overall. Now, coming to the third method, the third method is precipitation method. Now, what is the meaning of precipitates? Those, suppose, uh, uh, to understand this thing, I will give you a small example. Let us say I have a beaker in which we have added some water. I have taken a spoon of sand and I have added in that. Now, I am trying to mix it. We know that sand will not dissolve in the water, but it will settle down as a small particle. So, this settling down of the particle, the thing which you see at the bottom, the particles of the sand are actually called as precipitate. But here difference will be what? Here you can see the sand particles which are beyond the nano scale. But here what I should have through precipitate method, I will get the nano particles. The precipitates will be of nano scale level. So, basically in precipitation method, I am going to make precipitate of the nano material. There are so many examples. You can take different, different example. I have taken one which was having a diagram so that I can easily explain you or you can remember. Whenever you write any question answer in form of diagram which is well labeled, you score more marks. That is the reason I have chosen this one. In my method, I am going to produce the nano material of copper oxide. I am going to produce nano nanoparticle of copper oxide in form of through precipitation method. To understand that, let us just discuss the diagram first and then one by one I will explain you everything. I have two beakers, beaker A and beaker B. In beaker A, I have copper sulphate solution. In beaker B, I have hydroxyl ammonium chloride solution. Then I have third beaker. This is first, say second. This is third beaker. This third beaker is having sodium hydroxide and it is kept onto a cold water bath. This third beaker, it is being kept onto the cold water bath. Cold water bath is nothing but a huge container which is having cold water. In that I am keeping my beaker. It's not like beaker is completely immersed in it. The little portion of the beaker will be inside it. Then I have a conical flask. And here you can see we have a filter and here you will have your precipitates. Then I have a furnace for drying my precipitate and its temperature can go up to 200 to 250 degree Celsius. And finally, here what I get is copper oxide precipitate. Now, I will explain you one by one. First of all, we will take copper sulphate solution and I add or mix the distilled water in this and we will make a solution. So, copper sulphate we will take, we will add into the distilled water and I will make a solution. That solution is present in the beaker 1. I have taken ammonia, hydroxyl ammonium chloride in beaker 2. So, we have two liquids ready with us. Now, these two liquids slowly I will add into the third beaker which is already having sodium hydroxide inside it. Now, while doing the pouring part, we have to be slow. I will add slowly, I will stir it. I will add slowly, I will stir it. 
Like this, slowly, slowly you have to keep adding and you have to keep stirring. You will see that at the bottom of the beaker here, small precipitates will start forming. And this beaker is being kept inside a, hot, a cold water bath because when this reaction is taking place, heat will be produced. So that heat will be dissipated through the beaker into the water. So that the mixture, the solution which you are having will be at the normal temperature. After once this precipitation is ready, we will pour this precipitates into a funnel in order to filter it. And you will see that the liquid will go down here and get collected where your main precipitates will be inside this funnel. This particular precipitate will be again washed multiple times with the distilled water so that all the chloride which are present in the precipitate must be eliminated. Because I washed my precipitate with water, it is wet. So what we'll do? We need to dry it. So using a electrical furnace, I'm drying my precipitate and the temperature of it can goes up to 200 to 250 degrees Celsius. Once my precipitates are dried off, we will again heat them. And this time my temperature will be nearly 300 degrees Celsius and I'm drying it. I'm open drying it. Whatever precipitates you have, you are open drying it. And finally, what you are getting here is nothing but the precipitate of copper oxide. It is that simple. So basically, whatever I have spoke so far, can be easily presented in form of a single equation which is present in my next slide. This is that equation. We have copper sulphate. I have added hydroxyl ammonium chloride to it. Then we have added these two mixture to sodium hydroxide. The result is nothing but the copper oxide precipitate. This downward arrow is the arrow for representing precipitates. Plus, along with that, some byproducts are also produced. For example, nitrogen, sodium sulfate, water molecule, and sodium chloride. Now, this what we have explained theoretically through one equation, it is written there. Now, coming to the advantages of this process. It's a simple process, low cost. And it is a rapid method, means it's fast. It takes place quickly. You can make the nanomaterials quickly. Next is, in this particular method, the temperature which we are using, if you see here, maximum it can go only up to 300 degrees Celsius, right? So here the temperature which we are using here is maximum 300 degrees Celsius, so it is a kind of low temperature. So this particular setup, if you keep the precipitation method, if you want to use within maximum up to 300 degrees Celsius, you can arrange the temperature and you can get your nanomaterials. Now next and the last one, you are getting fine and uniform sized nanomaterial, which is very important. The quality of the material must be good. So here you are getting fine and uniformly sized nanomaterial. Now, Till here, it was all about precipitation method. So, if I just go back and I just refresh here, in bottom-up procedure, we have finished sol gel, we have finished precipitation method as well as the combustion method. So, all the bottom-up procedures are completed. You have to just remember the names and then you will remember the procedure. Now, I am going to start with the top-down procedures of synthesis. The first one is ball miling, which is very small and it may, uh, they may ask you for two marks question. This is the only one you may uh, get it for two marks. In long answer question, you may get it for two marks or three marks maybe. In long answer question, part of the long answer question, it can be asked for two to three marks. This is the simplest and the smallest one among all that. Otherwise, every, all other topic is for 5-5 for five, five marks, except this one because it's very simple and small. Now we are heading towards 
yeah the next one is top down method i have told you in top down method we'll take bulk material we'll make powder of it and then finally we make nano material out of it so in ball milling process we are going to do the same thing now to understand before we enter into this i'll give you just example imagine i have a chalk box in my hand a chalk box is present in my hand in that i have added say uh, say 10 pieces of chalks in the same box i have added say steel balls inside that now what am i doing is i am moving it vigorously now when we move it vigorously what would be the result after certain period of time if i open the box i'll see the big big chalk pieces they will start they some of them they may convert completely in powder form or maybe in the very smaller portion they might have been converted right so here what we have done is the bulk material was the complete chalk piece i have added a metal ball in that and i was shaking it vigorously so that ball it was hitting the chalk pieces and converting them into the powder form right now same thing is going to happen here also the word ball milling now here i am going to use the same thing you can see these balls these are the balls they are basically steel steel boxes or tungsten ball we have two balls you can use a ball of your uh, your choice but steel it will not react with many of the material and tungsten also won't react with many of the material that is the reason we are using solid steel or tungsten ball now these small balls are kept inside a beaker or in inside a vessel here my vessel is in cube shape you can have vessel even in circular shape so your vessel is up to you which kind of uh, manufacturing you want whichever way you feel it is easy you can use that so there is no hard and fast rule that the shape of the vessel must be in this tube form uh, in the uh, in this form or in the circular form it's up to you the vessel selection choice is yours now inside the vessel i have metal balls which are specifically steel or tungsten balls and they are solid they are filled from inside and whichever materials nano particle you want to make means whatever you have a bulk material you add into it once we add that material i have here one churner you can see this and it is having wings here so churner as the churner is moving as it is moving it makes balls to also move and once the balls are moving they will start crushing the nano material or uh, start crushing the bulk material into powdered form and once you do this process for a longer period of time those bulk uh, those powder will be finally converted into nano particles this is one of the simplest procedure now i have given you just now the example of chalk box right so when we have chalk box and i am shaking the uh, i am keeping some steel box i am shaking if you open you will see some chalk powder coming outside it will float similarly when you are churning here with the steel balls any kind of precursor some kind of fumes will be produced because we know that energy can neither be created nor be destroyed it can be converted from one form to the another form so same thing is happening here i am providing some external churning and energy it is converted so some few gases you may see which will come out for that we have separate inlets now this is all about the ball milling process this is one of the simplest process it has its advantages and disadvantages just go with that and the shape of the vessel can be anything it can be in this way it can be in circular or the spherical way now coming to the advantages the first advantage is it is used for high it will have high production rate high production rate here means that at a time i can produce large amount of nano particle at one go itself i can produce huge amount of nano particle if you go back and think about sol gel or precipitation or combustion process 
the amount of nanoparticles which are produced, they are very limited, they are very small quantity. But with this ball miling process, you can produce huge amount of nanomaterials. So that is what here it is written, high production rate. Now coming to the disadvantages. The first and the important disadvantage is whatever nanomaterials, <coughs> excuse me, whatever nanomaterials are produced, they are non-uniform size. Their size is not same. If they are of non-uniform size, then obviously the quality of the nanomaterial is low. So that is the biggest drawback with this ball miling process. That all the materials which are produced, they are of not same size. Second, high energy consumption means you can see here the quality is low. I am having low quality nanomaterial. My quality of the nanomaterial is low but the amount of input I am giving is more. So that is what it is high energy consumption. The amount of energy it is being consumed by the vessel in order to churn the balls and hence produce the nanomaterial is high. Next. It is loud noise, uh, the loud noise is produced during its working because it's, uh, it's having steel balls and tungsten ball. So when you rotate them, it will, the balls will hit the material inside it plus the vessel also. So they will produce a lot of noise. Fourth one is handling of the device is difficult due to its large weight. So now in the diagram what we have shown was a small sample diagram. Right, here what you have seen is a small sample diagram. But at the factory level when you do it, you will have a huge and big containers. So maintenance of those large containers are little difficult. So overall it has one basic advantage which is that you will have high production rate. Apart from that it has few disadvantages. Now moving to the next one. Physical vapor deposition. In short, PVD. In exam, they may ask you explain PVD directly or they may also mention physical vapor deposition complete statement. So you be ready for both the things. Now name, again I will stress on what is the name. Physical vapor deposition. So here physically Vapors of nanomaterial will be deposited. I will repeat again. Physically, vapors of nanomaterial will be deposited. That is why the name has come as PVD. Now to understand this, let us just see the diagram part first. And then I will come back to the explanation. Now look at this diagram. We have a chamber, I have a big chamber here and it is inside that chamber I have created vacuum. So inside the chamber vacuum is being created properly. Then I have a substrate, this is my substrate. Substrate means a container or a, a, a sheet onto which I can keep my nano material. Here the pink color which you see is not, nothing but the precursor and these are nothing but the vapors. Here this pink color line which you see is the deposition of nanomaterial and the yellow color shape which you see here is nothing but the component onto which the layer is being deposited. In PVD process, there are only four important steps and they are very small. First is evaporation, second is transportation, third is reaction and finally the deposition. You have to just remember these four words. You have to evaporate your sample or precursor. It should be transported properly to reach the target. In between some chemicals you have to mix to produce the reaction properly and finally it should be deposited. Now in a streamlined way we will go. Whichever materials, nanoparticle you want to make, the precursor of that will be taken onto a substrate. Here I will take the precursor of it onto a substrate. 
substrate is nothing but like a container into which you are taking the sub, uh, precursor. Now, this precursor is going to be heated up with some high energy electron beams. So, I am taking high energy electron beams and I am allowing it to fall onto the precursor. Now, when it happens, the precursor's temperature will increase and slowly the boiling part will take place. Once the boiling of the precursor started taking place, the evaporation will start taking place. So, that is the first point, evaporation. So, basically what I am doing here, the precursor which is also called as target here is being bombarded with the high beam electron in a vacuum chamber. So, here my chamber is already a vacuum chamber. I made the high energy electrons to fall onto the precursor. Once it happened, what will happen? The precursor will start getting heated up and evaporation process will take place. So, during the time of evaporation, we have that is nothing but the transportation. I have to transport my nanomaterial from the substrate to the place where I want it, means the component where I want it. So, the transportation process is the second one. Here, uh, during the time of transportation, we will mix them with some gases. Here, during the time of evaporation and transportation, along with the precursors molecule, we will add suitable gases in that, so that precursors can be easily lifted up and it should reach to the component where it has to be coated. That is the transport and reaction. Finally, the deposition. In this stage, coating builds up on the stage. Now here, once the precursor is transported, it will, uh, once it get reacted and reaches and slowly, slowly a layer will be formed here. Nanomaterials layer will be formed here. Now this process is, it sounds easy and it looks easy, but here the component onto which you are forming the thin layer of the nanomaterial, it's the layer of the nanomaterial is not uniformly coated. It's a random process. How it is random? Here you can see the evaporation is taking place, right? I cannot control how the molecules will get evaporated and where it will get coated. For example, I have did this experiment once. I got a layer of coating, nanomaterial layer coating. I have taken that out. Again, the same frame I am keeping back and again I am repeating the experiment. So, when we are repeating it again, again a coating is formed to the same frame. Now, if you check the nanomaterial coating which you have produced in earlier case and in this case, there is no guarantee that it will be same because I cannot control how the molecules are uh, going up and sticking to the uh, component. Yes, here we have used a curved safe component or the frame. We can have a uniform, uh, I can have a sheet like a uniform or flat frame also. But again, the question remains same. I don't know that all, I cannot give a guarantee that all the molecule will uniformly deposit here. There is a chance that most of the molecules or nanomaterial will be deposited at this region or there will be here deposition maximum or maybe at the center. So, there is no guarantee for it. That is one of the de uh, sorry, that is one of the major default with this particular process. So, this is what about the physical vapor deposition. Physically, I am making the vapors of nanomaterial to get deposited. Now, how you may say that where is the physical term? We are doing all chemically. No, here the main term is this component which you see, the curved safe component, physically I am keeping there and the way I want, in that way nanomaterials are being coated up. Now, the frame here, just now what I have told, it is curved one. I can have a flat one also. So, physically I am placing it there. So, as per my requirement and desire, we can change the frame physically. That is the reason, name is physical vapor deposition. Now coming to the advantages. The first one is, with the help of PVD, any kind of organic and inorganic materials, nanoparticle can be produced. It is easy. You can take organic and inorganic material in order to produce the nanomaterials. Next is, 
it is environmental friendly compared to the electroplating. In electroplating process, a uh, lot of uh, poisonous gases are released. Whereas in this process, no poisonous gas is being released. So it is quite environmental friendly. Coming to disadvantages. Now, in PVD, the first disadvantage is the instrument is little complex. Why it is complex? Because the substrate must be kept properly, exactly above the component so that most of the vapors of nanomaterial must reach there. Little complex. Plus, this complete process must be in vacuum chamber. So, vacuum of the chamber has to be maintained properly. Third, the component which you are keeping, the shape of it, I told you it is physical vapor deposition. So, we have to be physically taking it out, removing the coating layer, again physically keeping it back. So, it is little complex equipment. Next, it is extremely difficult to coat undercut and similar surface feature. This is what I was telling you just now that uh, suppose you have a sickle shaped. So, what happens there? I cannot give guarantee that uniform coating of the nanomaterial will take place. Wherever the vapors are going, it will go and stick to the component. We cannot give guarantee. Uniform coating uh, guarantee is not there. Third, rate of coating deposition is quite low. So, here is again a problem. Okay, fine if it is having a complex equipment, but my rate of coating means how the nanomaterials are getting coated up, it is also very slow, very slow process. Next, it operates at high vacuum and temperature. Temperature is also high because I have to take high beam of energy, highly energetic electron beam should fall on to the precursor in order to evaporate them. And high vacuum has to be maintained. This is what I was telling earlier also. Next, it requires skilled operators. Now, skilled operator means uh, uh, a person who knows how to take out the frame, again keep the or component of frame back properly, how to keep the precursor on the substrate properly so that maximum vaporization can take place. So, for that, a skilled person is required, a person who is aware of the designing part. Last, it has high capital cost. High capital cost means initially when we have to install it, all the apparatus, I need to spend lot of money. The money which has to be spent to keep the setup is high. That is called as capital cost. That is more in the case of PVD. Applications, basically the basic application of PVD uh, processes, they are specifically used to create a thin layer. The thin layer of nanomaterial are useful to increase the hardness of any material and it is making it wear resistance. Wear means if any cut, tear and all, that is wear resistance plus it will save it from the oxidation. So, the layer which are produced, the nanomaterial layer which or the coating which is produced, its main and basic function is increasing the hardness of the equipment onto which it is being coated or maybe making it wear resistance means some wear and tear, any kind of scratch or dent or bumps and oxidation means uh, for example, corrosion. Uh, any apparatus which is uh, made up of a material which is corrosion prone, if you keep this nanomaterial layer it will run for a very longer period with no corrosion. That is what is mentioned in the uh, next part. PVD coating is useful in aerospace, automotives, surgical dyes and molds for the material processing. Now, here aerospace means in aircraft related uh, equipment, you will have this kind of coating. Automotive means uh, your all vehicle, uh, bus, uh, your uh, trains, your uh, cars. Sir, in surgical equipment, I, I am using a surgical apparatus uh, which must not get corrosion. It should be away from the corrosion whether I dip it into water, I dip it into acid or I dip it into blood uh, or it get contacts with the blood. So, it should not have any corrosion. Apart from that, dyes and molds for the material processing 
obviously cutting tools and firearms. Now, I am not saying here alarm, it is arms. Firearms means, uh, suppose I am working in uh, glass industry, I have to have a big, uh, I have to have some holder, big holder. I will take the glass material with the help of a folder and I keep it inside the furnace. Once that uh, glass is getting little more in coming in the water cell, I will take it out. Again, I will make it in the shape. Again, I will keep it back, right? So, the particular apparatus which is holding my glass material and taking it into the furnace, that material is nothing but we call it as fire arms. So, for coating the fire arms, we can use this process to coat a nano layer onto it so that the life of the firearm can be increased. Yeah, now coming to the third which is nothing but top down, it is the example of top down procedure. This is what chemical vapor deposition method. Now, in chemical vapor deposition method, using chemicals, no physical, uh, no men or machine is required now. By using chemicals, I am creating vapors of the nanomaterial and depositing it. Now, first we will understand the diagram and then I will explain you what is what. In diagram, we have here. I have inductive or resistive heating means I can use inductors or maybe I can use resistor in order to heat. Inside this first chamber, I have kept my precursor. This first chamber is having precursor. Along with the precursor, I am adding some inert gases that is I am adding argon or neon these are inert gases any one you can use I have added that inside the first chamber. Then I have the second chamber in the second chamber apart from these two I am adding few more reactants some reaction will take place and finally clusters are formed and under the process of condensation once the clusters are formed, it will undergo condensation and the material which is formed will be allowed to fall onto this belt. This is a moving belt. It keeps moving like this. It will keep moving like this, which is attached with a scrapper. In order to collect the particles, we will have a container which will collect all the particles. So, I will just, I have just explained the components what we have on the screen. Now, one by one, I will explain you how it works. Now, as I told you, it is chemical vapor deposition. So, I am going to deposit the nanomaterial chemically. I am going to find, form the vapors of nanomaterial through chemicals. For that, whichever materials nanoparticle you want to make, take the precursor of that material in the first chamber. You can see here I have taken the precursor inside this first chamber. This precursor will be heated up with the help of inductors or maybe with the help of resistor. It could be an inductive heating or it could be a resistive heating. Once we heat the precursor, what will happen? Evaporation of the precursors will start taking place. So, here you will see the molecules of precursor and they are actually hot. The hot molecules of precursors will start moving upward. During this time, I will add argon or maybe neon atoms. 
एरगोन एंड नियॉन एटम्स दे आर बेसिकली कैरियर एटम एज द नेम सजेस्ट कैरियर मीन्स देयर मेन फंक्शन इज टू कैरी द हॉट मॉलिक्यूल्स ऑफ द प्रिकर्सर दीज हॉट मॉलिक्यूल्स हैज टू बी शिफ्टेड इन टू अनदर चेम्बर सो दे मस्ट बी लिफ्टेड अप इन ऑर्डर टू लिफ्ट अप वी आर यूजिंग एरगोन एंड नियॉन मॉलिक्यूल because they are inert gases so they don't react with any hot molecule of the precursor that is the main reason we have taken argon or neon these hot molecules of the precursor will enter into the next chamber here they are mixed with some more reactants and these reactants they have mixed whatever we have mixed they are cold molecules or atoms these are hot hot molecules and here we are mixing with some more reactant which will be cold in nature so when a hot and cold molecules they meet with each other evaporation condensation and evaporation both will take place due to which clusters are formed so basically here hot molecules are of precursor they are mixed with few more reactants which will be cold in the nature so hot and cold when they mix some condensation process will take place and hence cluster formation will take place then these clusters will again further allowed to undergo condensation and then that cluster will be allowed to fall on to the belt now this belt i have a holder i have a holder and this belt will keep moving like this say this is a holder and the belt is keep moving around the this the center part is nothing but the holder it's a base now here my base is there and this belt is kept on moving and this belt is attached with one scraper so you can just imagine suppose i have this belt and i have attached here one spoon let us say so the, the, there is one spoon which is attached with the belt now what is happening whenever the the precursor is falling on to the belt and it is moving this scraper will keep scraping it so you have to, how you have to imagine you know just uh, for example you have a thick ribbon on thick ribbon let us say you have applied some paste and now with spoon you are taking it out you are scraping it right so when you do that at down you will see some mixture will be falling down that will be a kind of powder way it will be not a complete particles but it will in the powder form the same thing is happening here the precursor or the cluster of the precursors are allowed to fall on to the belt and it is undergoing condensation so basically when it moves on to the belt it is getting cooled also and i have a scraper which keeps scraping which keeps collecting the nano material it keeps scraping it from the belt so whatever the scraper has collected it will fall on to uh it will fall down into a container where we can collect it so this is here what you see is nothing but your uh, nano material now here it is written cold finger cold finger is nothing but it is indicating that the material which is falling here they are cold enough they are they are not warm because it is coming out from the chamber where it is warm now once it moves on to the belt its temperature will keep decreasing means it becoming the cold and the cold finger here indicates that the scraper is whatever the scraper is collecting all the material has become cold now it's that that's it don't get away that uh, don't get confused that cold finger is some fancy word it's just indicating that the sample which is being collected is at normal temperature so this is all about chemical vapor deposition method i'm using some chemicals to produce nano material now uh, whatever i have told you i have written here for example first with the help of inductive and capacitive heating with the help of inductive and capacitive heating i'm uh, heating the precursor and heating the precursor in the presence of oxygen is nothing but called as pyrolysis we are heating up something in the presence of oxygen so that process is called as pyrolysis process next the hot atoms are mixed with carrier gases so that they can be easily lifted to the next chamber now these hot atom reacts with the cold atom now we have seen so far 
that uh, the hot atoms are mixing some more reactants here. You can see here again I am mixing some reactants. So, this is nothing but the cold atom and when hot and cold atom mix with each other, what will happen? Condensation and they will form clusters. Now, these clusters are then allowed to fall onto the moving belt with attached with the scraper which will keep scraping the nanomaterial. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, next is the clusters are allowed to condense on a moving belt arrangement with the scraper to collect the nanomaterial. This is what was the last step which I have told you. Now, here advantages. First one is the deposition rate is high, means amount of nanomaterials which are produced is a lot, a huge amount is being produced. The production of thick coating layers means I can get a really thick layer of the nanomaterial which comes under actually the deposition rate only. Next is co-deposition of materials at the same time is also possible. Now, what here they are telling is core deposition means simultaneously I can have two layers of nanomaterial depositing onto some substrate. Wide range of ceramic including nitrites, carbides, complex oxide for example, barium tit titanate can be produced. Now, with CVD process, I am able to produce nanomaterial of wide range of particles. For example, I can produce nanomaterial of nitrites, carbides and some complex oxide for example, barium titanate. So, the, the complex materials nanoparticle can be also made with this. So, CVD is the biggest advantage is this point only. Now, coming to the disadvantage. The first disadvantage what you see here is required high temperature obviously because you have to heat the precursor properly till the time when it gets evaporated. So, temperature operation is high. Toxicity of the precursor. Toxicity means the precursors which we are using because we are able to produce the nanomaterial of nitrites, carbides and complex oxides. So, they are a little poisonous. We have to be little careful with that. Mostly inorganic materials are used. Here, I am using inorganic material. I am not able to use organic materials. So, that is the disadvantage. Apart from all that, here you can control the size of the nanomaterial. If you control the rate of condensation and rate of evaporation, I can control the size of the nanoparticle. So, that is one of the advantage. Nanoparticle size can be controlled by simply controlling the evaporation and condensation rates. This is one thing which is being missed in this. So, I have added in that. Yeah. Now, so far what we have studied is the different ways through which you can fabricate nanomaterials. And what all the fabrications I have taught you so far, they are all equally important. Now, coming to the next topic and the last topic is characterization techniques. Now, first of all, what is the meaning of characterization? I understood what is nanomaterial. I understood how to make nanomaterial. I even understood that what are the advantages and disadvantages associated with all different types of fabrication. Now, I want to know how, how the nanomaterials, how, how they study the different properties of the nanomaterial. That is called as characterization. So, in order to study the structure, structural properties means shape, size, if any defect is present in the crystal, what is the lattice arrangement, where are the lattice point, if any defect present in the uh, lattice point or lattice plane, all this structural part can be studied under characterization technique. Apart from that, you can study the chemical, magnetic, optical and mechanical properties of the nanomaterial. So, in short, 
I can study everything about the nanomaterial under characterization techniques, right? So, we can in broader way if I have to tell you one can understand on study all the physical and chemical properties along with optical and magnetic property of the nanomaterials. There are three important characterization techniques. First one is transmission electron microscope. I repeat transmission, transmission electron microscope. In short, it is called as TEM, TEM, T E M. Next, scanning electron microscope. In short, S E M. Here, I am transmitting. Here I am scanning what electrons. I am transmitting electron in TEM. I am scanning electron in SEM. And the third one is X-ray diffraction technique. In short, XRD. So again, I'll stress on to the words transmission electron. I am transmitting the electron to study some characteristics of the nanomaterial. Second, scanning electron. I am using electron to scan the nanomaterial and X-ray diffraction. I am literally using X-ray. It will undergo diffraction obeying the Bragg's law and I will study some properties of the material. One by one, we will take it up. First coming to the transmission electron microscope. Now, there is some uh, basic thing, uh, some basic difference between TEM and SEM. So, I am just trying to make that thing clear first. TEM or transmission electron microscope are basically used to study the quality of the material, shape, size, growth of the layer. So, basically TEM is used to study which the quality of the material or nano material which you have, what is the shape, what is the size or what is the growth of the means how the layers are growing crystalline layers or nanomaterial layers are growing <coughs> excuse me <coughs> excuse me now for this a very simple procedure is there i have written in statement form but before i read this statement i'll show you the diagram and there i will explain you and then we can come back and again read this one now this is the ray diagram for tem this we call it as ray diagram. Now, ray diagram means I am using the electron uh, beams or rays to represent what is happening. First, I will explain the component in that and then we will have the brief explanation about it. Now, you can see here I have first one is I have here electron beam. So, here I must have an apparatus which produces beam of electron. Then I have this is first and this is second condenser lens. So, these two are actually the lens. Then I have a condenser aperture. Then I have my sample here. My sam there is a substrate onto which my sample is being kept. After that, I have, say this is fourth one, this is fifth one. After that, I have objective lens. Then I have objective aperture. Then I have another aperture, selected area aperture. The function of these two are same. So, I am not mentioning seventh number here. Then I have first intermediate lens and second intermediate lens. They both will have same functioning. Finally, I have projector lens and lastly, I have my main screen. So, basically, I have two kinds of lenses here. First one is condenser lens. So, these two are condensing lenses. Then I have an objective lens. Fa lastly, I will have some intermediate lens and projector lens. The, you remember the words of the name of the lenses from there only we can understand everything. I will explain the procedure 
and then I'll give you tip to remember it. Now, first of all, a monochromatic, a monochromatic beam of electron will be produced from an electron gun. Now, in Davisians and Germers experiment, we have already seen how an electron gun produces the beam of electron. So, you can uh, use any apparatus in order to produce the beam of electron. Now, here my word is I have to produce a monochromatic beam of electrons. Monochromatic word meaning is having a single wavelength. If any wave, any uh, electron beam is having a single wavelength, we call it as monochromatic. So, first of all, a monochromatic beam of electron is allowed to fall onto first condensing lens. Now, condenser meaning, condensing lens main function is to condense or to bring the beam of electron together. So, from the first condenser lens, the electron beams will be brought together and then it is again allowed to fall through the lens. So, basically I am trying to make my electron beams more narrow means I am trying to make them coherent. That is what I have written here. First and second condensing lens will make the beam, monochromatic beam of electron coherent in the nature. Once that electron beam is coherent, we will allow it to fall through the condenser aperture. Now, condenser aperture's main function is to eliminate all high angle electrons. Suppose I have a beam of electron coming like this, okay, they have got condensed. Still, you will have high angle beam. So, I want to eliminate those also. So, what we will do? We will keep a aperture here. Now, whatever beam of electron I am getting here, they are coherent as well as it is monochromatic. Right. So, now this coherent and monochromatic beam is allowed to fall onto my sample. So, basically here my sample is present. Now, remember here this is TEM, T transmission electron method, a microscope. So, here T, transmission of electron has to take place. Electron is getting transmitted through the sample which is kept onto a substrate. Once the electron beams get transmitted through the sample, it will fall onto an objective lens. Objective lens main function is to focus the image. From the objective lens, the ray of electron which is transmitted through the sample is allowed to pass through objective aperture and selected area aperture. The main function of these two are to maintain the contrast of the image. After that, the beam of electron has to pass through some first and second intermediate lens. Their main function is to enlarge the image. The whatever the image you got, it, it, its contrast is being improved. Now, I have to enlarge the image so that I can easily see it. Once the enlargement of image is being done with the help of first and second intermediate lens, it is allowed to fall onto the projector lens as the name suggests. Projector lens main function is to project the image on the screen. So, once the projector lens, the beam of electron passes through the projector lens, it is allowed to fall onto the main screen. This main screen is polished with the phosphorus material which will glow. So, whenever the beam of electron falls onto the screen, you will see bright and dark spots. The image will be in form of bright spots or dark spots. Remember that wherever you see the bright spot means that according, accordingly at that place the electron, uh, the, the thickness of the specimen or the thickness of the nanomaterial was less there. That is the reason electron beams can easily pass through it and hence you are seeing a bright spot. Wherever on the image you have a dark spot, it shows that the thickness of material or the specimen at that point was more. That is why electron beam cannot transmit through it and hence you are seeing a dark spot. So, I hope it is clear. There are many diagrams. You can draw any diagram whichever you feel comfortable. But this Dre diagram was, uh, it was easy to explain. Plus, it has everything stepwise and you will also logically connect with the system. Means how it is happening. So, I will give you a small logic for this. 
electron beams must be condensed first that is why I have I am having condensing lens then yeah electron beams must be condensed first and after that uh, all high angle electrons should be eliminated so I am having condenser aperture then this beam is allowed to fall onto the sample or specimen that sample or specimen which you having here the electron beam must get transmitted through it it should pass through it so that is what is happening here once the beams are passing through it I need to have objective lens and aperture in order to focus the image and as well as create the uh, contrast once it is done I have to enlarge the image so we are having intermediate lenses finally a projector lens which is useful in order to project the image and the screen onto which it is getting projected now advantages with this process uh, this uh, technique it is a powerful microscope with high magnification now this is very important the magnification is very high means whatever image is produced it's of uh, you can enlarge them easily and you can actually see it properly so magnification is very high next it provides topographical and morphological information now here topographical means all the physical physical features like shape size defect orientation and topo morphological morphological means uh, optical information like uh, reflection third is it is easy to operate with proper training but the TEM machinery you can operate it easily because you are having sets of lenses and all and when we speak in terms of optics lenses and all the arrangement of lenses should be perfect so that uh, maximum most of the electron rays should fall onto the specimen and hence you can have a better result so advantages I can say the resolution is very high second it can give you both information like topographical as well as morphological information third it's easy to operate now disadvantages the first disadvantage is you are getting only black and white image the image which you see it will be black and white and it is 2d image means you are not you are just seeing it as uh, uh, in the form of spots dark and bright spots black and white image and 2d image it is third the apparatus is large and it is little expensive comparatively third samples are limited to those that are electron transparent now this is what is also one big drawback now here I am saying you can study the information or characteristic of any nanoparticle with stem provided that particular nanomaterial it must be electron transparent it should allow the electrons to get transmitted through it if not then you cannot use transmission method okay so that is the biggest drawback with this technique now uh, I'm just showing you one of this image you can see I have uh, image and in this image you have dark and bright spots so this is how your image will look when you take tem this is how you sh you will see the properties now coming to the next one scanning electron microscope in this process the beam of electron will scan the specimen that's it in earlier method the electron is getting transmitted through the material in this process it will just scan it it will not go into depth of the material just a surface it will scan the surface now in order to understand please look at the diagram we have here now uh, this the first one is electron gun so main re main function of electron gun is to produce the monochromatic beams of electron those beams of electrons are then allowed to pass through the set of magnetic lenses so that all the electron beams will get coherent it will become as narrow as possible and a sharp and intense and coherent beam of electrons can be produced those beam of electrons are then allowed to fall onto the specimen 
though I have drawn here like this, but here you will have your specimen or the nanomaterial. Now, when this beam of electrons are incidenting or falling on to the nanomaterial, few of the electron will be scattered back. So, that is what we call as back scattered electron, back scattered electron and few of will be diffracted in another direction or reflected in another direction. Now, to capture the reflected ones, I have th those are also called as secondary electrons. So, I have a separate detector for secondary electron. The, the electrons which are get reflected from it will be collected through a separate detector which are also called as secondary electron detector. Whereas, the electrons which are back scattered, again it has went back. For that, I have a separate device which is called as black scattered, a back scattered electron detector. So, this detector will capture all the electrons which are scattered back and this will be reflected back, right. So, here this is the complete apparatus. Now, I will explain you one by one what is what. The beam of electrons are produced from the electron gun. Those monochromatic beam of electrons are then converted into fine pencil beam or it get collimated and allow with the help of two magnetic lens and allows to fall onto the specimen. The beam of electron is just simply scanning the surface of the specimen. So, the, it will just scan it, it does not go inside it, it just scan the surface of the specimen. The, during this process, there is a chance that few of the electron beams will be scattered back. So, in order to collect the, those, th those scattered back electron, I have a separate detector for it which is designed, which is kept here. And in order to collect the secondary electrons, we have secondary electron detector. All these electron detectors will capture the image and onto a display unit that image will be displayed later. The image which are produced from this particular mechanism, they are of high resolution that is right plus they are like photo kind. How if you take the photo, how your image will be seen exactly in that way we are getting. Here there will be no uh, dark or uh, bright and dark spots, you will have real picture kind of image. And in this process, I am not at all, I am just scanning the material or the specimen, I am not at all allowing the electron to get inside it. So, in earlier case, we had a problem that specimen should be in such a way that it should be electron transparent because electron has to transmit through it. But here I need, it, it need not to be like that, here I need not to have a specimen which uh, should be a electron transparent. Now, whatever I have just now told is written in form of sentence here. Uh, here I would like to add one information that this black scattered electrons, the back scattered electrons, the electrons which here just now we have shown, no? the back scattered electrons, this one, this detector. So, black scattered electrons, they, when it is being collected, they give you information about the atomic number. You can get information like atomic number and all the topographic information which we have already discussed like shape, size, orientation, defect in the crystal as well as electrical information. So, with the help of back scattered detector, I am getting the information like topographical information as well as electrical information plus atomic number and all I am getting to know. With the help of secondary electrons, one can only understand the topographical information of the specimen. Now advantages, here I can scan bulk samples large amount of sample I can scan at a single go. If you have a big specimen, you can scan it easily, bulk. Bulk samples can be observed and large sample area can be viewed. So, larger area can be viewed because we have to just scan the surface of the specimen here. Second is, it generates photo like image. Unlike TEM, here the images which are formed are like photo you can actually see it, it is not like a dark or bright spots. So, it gives you more information how exactly, or gives you the information of or property of the material more clearly. Next, disadvantages. The very first disadvantage is it is a very huge and expensive. This process is little 
expensive one. Next, it's a time consuming process. Yes, this particular technique, characterization technique, it takes lot of time. Scanning part takes lot of time. Next, non-conductive samples. Non-conductive samples needs to be coated with conductive layer. Now understand this part. Here, electron beam has to scan the specimen. So if the specimen is non-conductive one, electron beams cannot scan it. So during that time, we have to coat such kind of material with some conducting layer so that electron can go there and scan it. So that is the uh, drawback with this method that non-conductive samples needs to be coated with the conducting layer. If your sample is uh, non-conductive, then electron cannot uh, go there and scan it easily. So you have to just coat it with some conducting layer so that electron can reach there and it can scan it easily. Next, it can't resolve internal structures of the domains. Now this is what I was telling you. Because it is not going inside, it is just scanning the surface of the material. So internally, the domain part of the nanomaterial or the specimen cannot be studied with it. Now this is how in laboratory you will see the apparatuses. This is the picture of scanning electron microscope SEM. And you can see on this side, these, this is how the images you will get with SEM. And you can, uh, you can just relate that you are exactly how if you take a picture or photo of yours, exactly in that way you are getting images here with SEM. Yeah, so with TEM and SEM, uh, characterization is over. Uh, biggest uh, disadvantage with SEM was, for, with this method was that whatever specimen you have, it should be conducting one. So that electron can easily fall onto it and can scan. With transmission electron, the biggest drawback is the whatever material or the specimen you have taken, it should allow the electrons, it should be electron transparent, it should allow the electron to pass through it. Now, because of these two basic things, the basic uh, problems, there is one more technique which is called as X-ray diffraction technique of characterization and it comes under spectroscopy. Till now, whatever you have seen, whichever method you have seen, they are all microscopes. Now, what I am having is, the last one is spectroscopy. Now, it is very simple. X-ray diffraction is the bottom line. I will take X-rays. I will allow to fall the X-rays onto my specimen or the sample. And once the specimen or the sample fulfill the Bragg's law of uh, diffraction, it will get diffracted. The diffracted beam I will capture and I will present it onto the projector or some screen. This is a basic thing which we are having here. So the same thing I have shown with the help of diagram. X-rays are allowed to incident onto the specimen. This is my specimen or the nanomaterial. And it is present on a flat substrate, on a sheet or a plate. My substrate is being kept. Now, which all, out of all these atoms, whichever atoms planes are fulfilling the Bragg's law of diffraction, will diffract the X-ray and that reflected X-ray will be captured with one device which can hence project the image onto a secondary device. This is a basic principle of it. Now, this is nothing but the Bragg's law. We all know that the Bragg's law is nothing but n lambda equals to 2d sine theta, where n is what? Order of diffraction. Now, order of diffraction can be starting from first order, second order, third order and so on. Lambda is nothing but the wavelength. Here, Lambda will be the wavelength of the X-ray. So here is my X-ray. Whatever is the wavelength of my X-rays, that is the lambda. 2D sin theta. Now D here is nothing but interplanar separation. I, th this is the first plane. This is the second plane. The distance between these two planes are called as interplanar spacing. That is nothing but the D. Uh, that is represented by D. And that is what is present here in this equation, sine theta. Theta is nothing but the 
angle of diffraction. So, now when x rays are allowed and it is allowed to fall on the specimen, it is not necessary that all the uh, specimen which is present there, all the plane will fulfill this Bragg's law. There will be some selective planes present in the crystal or present in the specimen which will fulfill this Bragg equation. And if they fulfill this Bragg's law, then only they are getting diffracted. And once they are getting diffracted, will be captured with the help of a detector. And from the detector, it is projected onto some screen. Now, coming to the characterization, what basically it can do with the help of X-ray diffraction, we can understand the lattice constant, which is also known or represented with small letter A. So, I can understand the lattice constant. Lattice constant means, for example, I here I have atoms here, right. So, the distance between the two nearest neighbor, neighboring atom, this is nothing but your lattice constant. So, one can understand the lattice constant with the help of X-ray diffraction. Second, I can find out D spacing, means I can find out what is interplanar separation. Next, thickness of the sample can be understood, whatever specimen I have, what is the thickness of the specimen can be easily understood. Fourth one is orientation of the sample, means how crystals are oriented, in which direction or which plane they are oriented. Third, grain size. Grain size means what is the size of the particle, what is the size of nanoparticle can be also understood. And finally, the crystal structure. So, if you see here, I am getting huge information with X-ray diffraction method also. And X-ray diffraction, uh, diffraction method is cheaper than TEM and SEM. Now, coming to disadvantages. Again, first disadvantage with this is, it is a time consuming process. Second one is required large volume of sample. Now, this is what is the biggest disadvantage. Now, large volume of sample means, when we take nanomaterial, if I, I have to have large amount of it, so that out of all these uh, uh, nanomaterial sample, there will be some samples in which the planes will be in such a way that it can obey Bragg's law, the diffraction law. That is what this, this particular diagram which I have drawn. You can see here we have large amount of sample we have to take because all the samples which I have taken, there is, there is no guarantee that this particular, uh, for example, let us say this is my one sample uh, nanomaterial present here. There is no guarantee that when X-ray falls onto it, the planes present in this atom will satisfy the Bragg's law and hence I can see the diffracted image. So, possibility is less. That is the reason I need large amount of nanomaterial so that the possibility of diffraction will be there and hence I can get the information. Now, coming to the application. X-ray diffraction through this, uh, we can make scratch proofs, uh, yeah, this application, uh, like this, uh, what you see on the screen right now, they are application of nanomaterials and this is the complete, like, uh, there are many application, huge range of application in all the fields, but I have written and quoted something which you can relate to day-to-day -day life, means which you see day-to-day -day life and you can relate and you can remember, you need not to specifically mug it up. Now, first one is scratch proof sunglasses. Uh, you might have seen, now there are some reading glasses and sunglasses, uh, they will advertise that it is scratch proof, they will throw it down and they will show you that no scratch is being uh, seen on the uh, uh, glasses, that is because they have coated it with the nanomaterial. The specific nanomaterial which is used for coating is aluminum silicate. So, aluminum silicate nanoparticles coating will be done onto the glasses which makes it scratch resistant. Second is crack resistance paint. Now, here I am using tungsten oxide. This is a symbol for that. Tungsten oxide is used. A nanomaterial of tungsten oxide is added into the paint so that the paint will become crack resistant. You might have seen that. Uh, we have, uh, they will show in some YouTube videos also. Uh, they will take some paint and on the cracks of the walls or cracks of the roof, they will add that paint. And uh, now, if you pour the water and all, it will not 
uh, under uh, it will not go to the lower level that particular paint is having nanoparticle of tungsten oxide that is the reason it become crack resistance now next is transparent sun screen now this is what like uh, girls can easily relate with this suppose uh, if you go outside and apply sunscreen basically when you apply sunscreen it will give you whitish coating on your skin so now what they are doing that whitish coating nobody likes on the skin so they are adding zinc oxide the nano material of zinc oxide in the sunscreen and that if you apply now that sunscreen it will completely absorb into your skin actually it is it's a nano particle that is why you can't even see through your eyes so you will feel that it is completely absorb and there is no white coating present on your skin next is waterproof or stain repellent shirts you might have seen some advertisement where uh, uh, so like some they are wearing a shirt and if you throw water onto it uh, water will fall down or if any kind of dirt or dust is it get repellent similarly uh, there are some shoes if you dip it into the water or mud uh, water or mud will not stick onto it why because we are coating those material with the nano material here uh, in the shirts we are using fibers uh, i'm using one thread of fiber a uh, one uh, thread of uh, my fabric and one thread of nano material so like this we are layering it and making a material which can be wearable next is ceramic coating for solar cell now we all know that that we all are moving toward the solar energy uh, in solar energy the ceramic coating which has to be done for the conduction part there we are using nano material because in solar cells the maintenance part is a lot so if you coat it with the ceramic coating is done with the nano material then maintenance cost and maintenance will re reduce next is self cleaning windows we have some window span uh, and that is also available for uh, cars uh, you might have seen that if you uh, there is some uh, chemical they will apply on the windscreen or on the screen of the uh, glasses uh, in the house and, and then they will clean it off and they'll wipe it off and if you throw water if you throw any kind of dust it will not stick to it why because they are using some nano material in order to coat the surface so that water or any dust will not stick to your vehicle or maybe to the windows of your house basically this is used commercially where uh, the complete building is having glass structure so there basically they use this because glass when it sticks the dust sticks to the glass it's very difficult to maintain them so there they will use nano materials in order to coat it so i believe uh, with this i have finished and covered every part of the nano material which are going to be asked in the exam so here uh, important is there are only two short answer questions uh, what is nano material quantum confinement and surface to volume ratio apart from that all the characterization techniques all the fabrication techniques they are under long answer question the ball milling technique is the only one question which may be a part of the long answer question they don't ask you for directly 5 marks they'll ask you for 2 or 3 marks as a part of a long answer question